initial goal of the Voyager program was to study the outer planets of the solar system. Originally conceived in the late 1960s as part of the Mariner program, the two robot probes were moved into their own separate program, Mariner Jupiter Saturn, which was later renamed Voyager. Due to an ideal planetary alignment of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, Voyager 1 launched on September 5, 1977. Voyager 2 launched on August 20th of the same year. <laughs> yeah, you heard that right. Voyager 2 launched before Voyager 1. And before you ask why they did that or didn't just switch the names around, I have an answer for you. Voyager 2 had a longer, more circular planned trajectory to Voyager 1, and it was going to take longer to get to Jupiter and Saturn. Voyager 1 would reach these Jovian giants first, therefore receive the honorary title of number 1. Originally, both probes were planned to explore the two largest planets in our solar system in detail. Voyager 1 reached and began photographing Jupiter in January of 1979. It encountered Saturn in November 1980. After a brief flyby with the moon of Titan, Voyager 1 continued on its way to the distant edge of the heliosphere. Voyager 2 made its closest approach to Saturn on August 26, 1981. Because of its particular trajectory, Voyager 2 was able to make flybys of Uranus in January 1986 and Neptune in August of 1989. Voyager 2 then began its own journey headed beyond the heliosphere. In 2013, Voyager 1 passed beyond the boundaries of our solar system. In 300 years, it will reach the Oort cloud, taking 30,000 years to pass through it. In roughly 40,000 years, it will pass within 1.6 light years of the star Gliese 445. In 2020, Voyager 2 passed beyond the boundaries of our solar system. In about 40,000 years, it will pass within 1.7 light years of the star Ross 248. If undisturbed for 296,000 years, it will pass within 4.3 light years of the star Sirius. On each of these space probes is a gold plated audio visual disc containing information about Earth, its people, cultures, and history in case either of these probes should one day encounter an advanced intelligent alien life form. I stand before door 42 with some trepidation, but then on the other side of this door should be the answer to life, the universe, and everything, right? Monica is by my side, and we're ready to go in, through another door and into another world. I'm somewhat anxious because without the internet, I feel completely disconnected from my own world, a planet I used to call home. It sounds insane to say it like that, but from where I'm standing, I can see that swirling blackness encompassing ostium and know confidently that there's nothing earthly about it. And I very much haven't forgotten about those devastating catastrophes wreaking death and havoc on the planet. I've also done my best to ignore and disbelieve in the minute possibility that ostium caused each of those catastrophes, and the logical extrapolation that would be if... <laughs> a big if. The biggest of ifs. If opening doors in time and space caused those terrible things to happen on my world, I would be more responsible. And if that was somehow, horrifically, the case, what has opening more doors done? I'm not going to talk to Monica about this, at least not yet anyway. It all feels too fragmented and random, and she'd probably just call me a conspiracy nut against Ostium or just making a big deal out of nothing. But Ebola, earthquakes, tsunamis, and giant radioactive clouds of death are far from nothing. Are we going to wait here all day, or are you going to open the damn thing? I suck in a breath, and we step through. My eyes are closed. There's a humming sound and an airy sound 
like air conditioning doing its job. Everything feels mechanical, artificial. I open my eyes. My first thought is, we're in another space station. But it couldn't be Mars again, could it? A different time, maybe? But as my eyes take in more details, I realize this is different. No, this is much cooler. We're on a spaceship. Cue the 2001 theme. Monica walks ahead and over to the large window in the side of the ship, looking out at deep space. It's wide enough for both of us to stand side by side, and I join her. Touching my hand to the glass, or perspex, or whatever material it is, future plastic for all I know, I cut my hands around the outside of my face to block out the lighting in the hallway. Outside, it's all black. But one by one, and then by the hundreds and thousands and beyond, the stars make themselves known in the verse. My eyes start telescoping around, trying to take in as much detail from this view as possible. I make a big circumference with my optical receptors, and when I get to the six o'clock position, I see something that causes my jaw to fall open. It's a massive planet. Of course, from my context, a small moon would seem massive, with a vertical and horizontal set of rings rotating around it, so sort of like Saturn times two. I can physically see those rings made of who knows what, rock, ice, space dust. Satellites and orbiting mechanical parts, alien pods, it could be anything, but it's magnificent and mesmerizing. The planet below is a swirling miasma of purples and blues and oranges mixing together like planet-encompassing taffy. Does that indicate it's a gaseous planet? Could there be anything living on it? An alien civilization? Do they have some rocky terra firma to exist on? Or do they reside in incredible floating fortresses and cities? <laughs> Cloud City, anyone? Perhaps beneath these mixing colors is a habitable atmosphere for these alien beings. The possibilities and complexities are endless. I want to take a scout ship or a survey vessel, if this spaceship has such a thing. But no, I don't have the time. The blackness is next to invisible, even looking through the window with all this space around us. But I can feel it. There. Far away and distant. But waiting. Waiting for me to weaken, to succumb, let it overpower. To begin its inevitable approach and onslaught. It's why I'll always have a limited time when I pass through a door in Ostium. Why I will never be able to fully explore the world on the other side as much as I want to. There's a literal ticking clock. Actually, no, sorry, that's not true. There's a metaphorical ticking clock when I pass through a door in Ostium and only have so much time to enjoy the view and do what needs to be done. And if the blackness gets you, what then? Do you wink out of existence like one of these millions of stars? Are you disassembled one molecule, one atom at a time, flinging off electrons into the deep, dark cosmos? Who knows? Monica doesn't have a clue. I certainly don't. It's a zero-sum game, or is that a fait accompli, or neither? Or both? The point is, the only way I'll ever know what the blackness will truly do to me is by letting it envelop me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do that. Don't worry. I've got to get moving. Find out what I can about the ship. Find the artifact and move on. The more I meditate on everything we're doing here, passing through doors and creating a bloated rift in time that probably shouldn't exist, no wonder there's never anybody here when we come through. The sheer energy dissipation to create this tear in space must be equivalent to a gravitational wave, which is only created when two black holes collide. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about a grande burrito buttload of energy. Trust me, it makes sense. 
I guess being on a spaceship millennia, or perhaps tens of millennia in the future, has delivered an ostium-level existential crisis upon my frail mortal coil. God, what am I even saying? Find the artifact. Got it. Monica's still glued to the window, and I can totally relate, but I grab her hand and drag her away, heading down the corridor toward I don't know what. The humming, with occasional beeps and squeaks from future spaceship tech, is the only noise that accompanies us. We reach the end and approach a metal door that whooshes open with that patented Star Trek sound. There's a small box-like room on the other side. Can it be what I think it is? Dare I dream? I drag Monica inside and turn around. The door whooshes closed. The look on her face isn't a happy one. Watch this. Computer. Deck one. Bridge. I wait for a friendly voice to reply. Hopefully female. Possibly male. Perchance in English? Instead, there are a series of squawks. Then the turbo lift, or whatever distant future spaceship elevator this is, starts moving first sideways for some time and then ascending. The speed feels impressively fast, but the G-forces are under control and we don't lose our footing. We reach our destination and with a whoosh, the door is open. I can barely contain my excitement as I step out onto the bridge of this possible galaxy-class starship. Does the outside look like the Enterprise NCC-1701D? Almost certainly and undeniably not. But there's always a chance. And regardless, here I am, standing on the main command center of a ship of the future that can travel through space. The beeps and squeaks and humming continue here. Before us is a giant oval window or screen showing us what's in front of the ship. I can't see any of the ship on the outside to give an idea of what it looks like. So either this is a camera view at the front of the ship or the bridge is located at the very bow. So many questions and there's no way to get outside and check. In space, no one can hear you. Wonder. What I can see from this oval view are stars and some distant planets, each with their own individuality, their own uniqueness and colors. It's gorgeous and mesmerizing. And I think I see a comet there, shooting by with its tail of ice and rocks stretching out behind it like a giant arrowhead. Incredible. There are around 20 to 30 stations, each with their own individual raised platforms, making their individual space clear. From each of these platforms extends a sleek white metal-looking tube slash stand, curving around and opening out into an oval shape that looks about the size of a 40-inch TV. It's all completely white. Even the face of what I'm assuming to be a computer screen. Looks like a cross between stuff from the WALL-E movie and a product developed by Apple. It's really sleek and cool looking. And that's it. No apparent buttons or toggles or switches. Looks like everything's touch screen here, I assume. Of course, it could also be some cool telepathic mind meld thing between the spaceship computer and the crew. Your mind to my hard drive. But without a member of said crew, we can't know. And then I see something slumped over one of the stations, kind of hanging over it like a tossed piece of clothing or a blanket. Monica's eyes have been rubbing the bridge just like mine. And then she sees the unidentified form and starts running. I quickly follow. It's a big bridge, even by Trekkie standards, so it takes us a few seconds to reach it. Once there, it's obviously a body slung over the workstation console. We slowly walk around it, trying to recognize who it is, not wanting to touch or disturb it. Eventually, Monica crouches down and then curves herself to bend underneath the console and see the man's face. Private Tanaka. I don't see any blood, any obvious cause of death. I take a breath. Monica, we need to get going. She looks at me. The blackness is getting stronger, starting to overpower me. We don't have a ton of time. The artifact? Not here. Not on him. We need to take the turbo lift again. Well, thank fucking God for small favors. She leads the way to the turbo lift. The doors whoosh open, and we step inside, letting them close behind us. 
think about what to say, what to ask for. Where do we need to go on the ship? I close my eyes and try to spread my thoughts to encompass the entire ship, somehow. I don't really know how to describe it. It's weird, but it works. I feel it in one small spot on the ship, sort of like our ostium infrared maps, but with、um, touch thoughts, you know. Cargo bay 42. I finally say, the galactic space elevator, whatever you want to call it. If I keep saying turbo lift, I might get Gene Roddenberry's foundation or trust coming after me. When it comes to a bunch of high-paid lawyers, I'm sure they'd be able to find me in Ostium, even if Ostium isn't attached to a specific point in space and time anymore. It begins moving down first at an impressive speed, then zipping to the left for some time, finally to the right for a few seconds and stopping. Again, even though we had to be moving at an incredible speed. Neither Monica nor I are on the floor, or even slightly shaken up. Both perfectly still, like we're on one of those horizontal escalators that seem to move you just that little bit faster at airports. Though I'm not sure if the physics actually proves it. I swear I've had slow walkers not just match my pace, but actually pass me when I'm on one of those things. Still beats walking. The door is open to a large hangar, as kind of expected. Is it in here? I give Monica a nod and step out. It's dimly lit. I ask the computer for lights, and suddenly the entire hangar is bathed in bright floodlights that are quite blinding at first. After some time for retinal recovery, I'm able to see what's in this cargo bay. Two strange-looking contraptions, about twenty feet away, looking like a binary pile of scrap metal. There are pieces of metal sticking out at odd angles, some thick and short. Others thin and long. Along the arms of metal are chunks of more metal that could be anything: instrumentation, sensors, weapons. At the heart of each contraption is a big white-looking dish with a central node pointing out from it. Huh, kind of looks like an old-school satellite dish from the 80s or something. I remember watching this cheesy horror movie as a kid called Terror Vision, about some alien monster that was somehow summoned from space and was able to pass through the television screen and attack and kill people. I remember it mostly being a big brown slimy thing with tentacles, like a giant octopus. Anyway, the thing I remember most about it was outside the house of the family that was getting visited and murdered by this alien creature. There was this hella big ass satellite dish on a swiveling box. They could control it with a cheap-looking giant remote control. Looked more like a giant remote for a radio-controlled car. And I think the idea was you could turn the satellite dish in any direction and get like a hundred or more channels from Russia or China or wherever. Turn it another and get channels from Europe and the UK. Not exactly how it works, but it was a crappy '80s horror movie after all. But the important detail from this random memory is the satellite dish. These look the same, about the same size and face. Oh, and there's that giant radio telescope at Arecibo, Puerto Rico. Again, these are much, much smaller. These are the thoughts running through my brain as I study these things. I can see from the look on Monica's face, she's wondering what the hell exactly I'm doing. Why am I taking so long? Just find the damn artifact and. Let's get the heck out of here. I get that. Really, I do. But there's something else going on here. Something that I'm not catching, and I don't have time to explain it to Monica. Hang on a sec. There's something. Holy shit! And then I have it. This is Voyager One, Voyager Two. This stops Monica. She knows about the Voyager exploration program, or at least she's heard about it in some shape or form. And then I launch into my spiel. You got the intro at the beginning of this recording, and here I am somehow standing before these two seemingly simple contraptions launched about 50 years ago. They're the only inventions by humankind to have left the solar system and passed into interstellar space, at least in my lifetime. I know it's not over yet, but it doesn't seem too likely that there'll be a whole armada of either manned or unmanned probes shooting beyond the heliosphere and deep into outer space within the next 60 or 70 years. And that's when I realize the monumental precedent that is being set here. These two robotic probes have been found by someone or something—an alien being, 
an alien race. They've been traveling through the cosmos for who knows how long, and an intelligent extraterrestrial <laughs> being found them and took them in to study, to learn about them. And in so doing, learn about the human race <laughs> and planet Earth. In both of these probes is a golden disk containing a wealth of information about who we are. A committee was convened to decide what to put on the record, headed by one Carl Sagan. It contains a variety of pieces of music, 115 images, and a collection of sounds from nature and our world. Greetings spoken in 55 ancient and modern languages, as well as some other human sounds like laughter and footsteps. There's also a message from then-President Jimmy Carter and UN Secretary Kurt Waldheim. These golden disks were placed just in case an intelligent alien race found them and wanted to know where these probes came from. And here's the actual proof that they've been found. To call it a historic, yes, a historic, never an historic moment doesn't do it justice. It's one of those moments that you imagine and dream about. And here it is, in the flesh, so to speak. Simply incredible. And that's when the alarm bells, air raid sirens, and klaxons start going off. Whatever this spaceship uses for an emergency sound is now making itself known. From somewhere deep in the ship is the sound of wrenching and destruction. Something has gone terribly wrong. What? It's the blackness. We need to get the fuck out of here right now. I give Monica my combined no shit Sherlock and now I'm fucking terrified look. I drop to my knees, looking beneath one probe, then switching to the next. I find a tiny golden disc about the size of a silver dollar. Bingo. Then we charge for the turbo lift. Inside the door closes and the computer awaits direction and instruction, and I have no idea what to say. What hallway was it that had the ostium door? It didn't seem like any particularly important one, so... Monica is panicking right along with me, and she just yells at the ceiling. Take us to the fucking ostium door. Space elevator, or is it the space vader, starts moving. Where will it take us? We go a number of directions and then stop. The door whooshes open and there's the ostium door staring at us, patiently awaiting a return. We start running and about ten feet down the hallway, the artificial gravity of the spaceship fails. Blackness got to whatever part of the ship controlled it. I'm guessing the bridge is long gone. Now I'm as helpless as a toddler in water for the first time. I watch Monica and soon copy her. She looks for handholds on the ceiling, the walls, the floors, whatever piece of surface she can find to grab onto, and pulls herself along. It's not as fast as running, but she makes it look pretty close, like some skilled marine animal flitting along through the water with ease. She makes it look like no big deal, and I'm instantly both impressed and envious. I flail my way along behind her and we make it through the ostium door. I don't bother looking back, not wanting to know how close the blackness actually is. It feels great to be on solid ground and submitting to the awesome powers of gravity once again. We go through the motions, offering up our tiny golden sacrifice to the map table god which it takes and consumes heartily and without question. After some food, it's time to crash. Another day, another door, another fucking body. One of these days, it's going to be Steve. I can almost feel it. I'll see his corpse displayed in some lavish way for my eyes only, I'm sure. Thanks to Ostium. And I'll have one of two reactions. Either I'll just completely lose my shit and collapse into a pile of leftover nothingness that doesn't want to live, or I won't give a damn. As the corpses keep piling up, I know it's pretty sick to admit, but I'm becoming... not just numb, but acclimatized. It's becoming no biggie. And that's pretty fucked up. But I see it in Jake too, in his eyes, in Yord. Eventually, the body count's going to reach saturation. The squad will be extinguished. Rendered fucking extinct. And if the bodies keep turning up, it's going to really fuck with me. 
Where the hell will they be coming from? Fuck knows. And if it's just one more, well, we'll know exactly who that is, won't we? And it'll all be for nothing. One big fucking waste of time and space. It was trippy seeing the Voyager probes, both of them. I know a little about them. Did some recon on them for fun. I know Jake was losing his fucking mind over seeing them there on that spaceship. But he loses his fucking mind pretty easily in Ostium. With the crazy shit that's on offer here. Still, it was pretty trippy, knowing what the universe can actually do. Getting those itty-bitty pieces of metal and electronics way out there. Finding them a home with an alien race. Kind of tells you anything could happen. Sky's the fucking limit. And there's your tagline for the great town of Ostium. Put it on a bumper sticker. Slap it on a t-shirt. Hell, if we were still connected with the real world, I'd mosey on down to the road to that old Ostium sign. Paint the fucking endearment on it myself. Sky's the fucking limit. The ends justify the means. Isn't that the saying? Whatever it takes. Sacrifices have to be made. You win some, you lose some. It'll turn out all right in the end. No pain, no gain. You have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched. This language has a ridiculous amount of phrases for vague things that don't seem to mean shit when you say them. But when you think about them, When you get to the root of it, to the heart of the matter, to the center of the storm. See? There I go again. Nothing concrete. Nothing real. But sometimes it's really hard to describe something. Be exact. Specific. Distinct. Get it right. Convey meaning. Not spouting vague, nothing words that don't actually tell you what the fuck is actually happening. (sighs) Ahem. Sometimes, you've got to do what it takes. God damn it. Why can't I just say what I mean? Because, because I don't want to mean what I say. And there I go again. I feel like I'm stuck in the Groundhog Day episode of a bad sci-fi show. Or is that Siffy? Every time I see it, that's the way I hear it. It's hard to talk about. (laughs) In every sense of the word, I guess. Jake will have his way. His words, his feelings, his emotions, his thoughts, his... urges. I'll let him tell it his way. Sleep is starting to happen a little better for me. 
The nightmares are starting to fade into the hazy blackness like forgotten ghosts. Now, why did I say that? Why did I say it that way? As a human being who considers himself pretty fluent in the English language, and taking into account its simply vast vocabulary, why did I choose those particular words? Paging Dr. Freud. I think I might have some unresolved issues with something called the blackness and or ghosts. Anyway, for now, they're just uncomfortable and disconcerting dreams. But the important point to all this is that I'm getting more sleep and feeling a little more connected with the real world, even if ostium physically isn't. Monica wasn't by my side shaking me awake from night sweats and somnolent terrors, and while I'm never against her being by my side for just about any occasion, this particular one is less than ideal. I know it's perfectly natural, or psychological rather, what I'm going through, and having never done therapy before, even though there are probably many who say I should have after the death of my parents, or experienced a severe trauma event, again, other than the death of my parents, at an older age, I really don't know what to expect. I'm supposed to get over this in a day? A couple days? Weeks? Longer? I just don't know. Seems when it comes to a case of PTSD, again, of which I will fully admit I know nothing about, it's something that takes time for whatever scarring needs to heal. And I'm just going to stop talking about what I know nothing about. All I can give voice to are my personal thoughts and feelings in this situation. I don't know if I've achieved some sort of internal catharsis now with the passage of time and what I went through on the other side of that door with the infinity symbol, where whatever needs to be resolved within me, in my heart, mind, and soul is getting there. But I've reached some sort of restoration, and things are looking better. As for what happened on the world I used to call home, and what is continuing to happen, I still remain in the dark. No messages or contact from anyone, old co-workers, old friends, and nothing from Dave. For all I know, he's gotten himself completely lost in that new ostium he found. He went through that first door to Roanoke and messed up in some way. Maybe he tripped and hurt himself. He got stuck there and the door closed forever. The blackness came and swallowed him up like a galactic vacuum cleaner that has no qualms about sucking up every iota of matter and life into oblivion. Possibly what might have happened to Steve and maybe those military guys. I just don't think it's right. I haven't heard something. I know the internet's having its own connectivity issues and I'm getting nothing coming my way, but stuff seems to be okay going on. Dave's always managed to find a way, somehow, to get in touch with me. Through thick and thin and hell and high water, especially with him riding those treacherous Atlantic seas in that tanker, he's always managed. And now, there's just silence. I think... I think I might be getting a mild case of ostium fever knowing what's going on elsewhere and how this might be the rest of my life, the rest of our lives, spending our days traveling through doors, bringing back artifacts, and doing the same thing day after day after day. Ostium threw a monkey wrench into the works with the infinity door to my old place of employment, but since then, after the earthquake repaired itself somehow and put Ostium back together again, just like Humpty Dumpty, it sort of felt like being on autopilot, doing the same thing, with no end in sight, I still don't understand why Ostium is doing what it's doing to me, making us do it. Monica has Steve driving her through every door, hoping and waiting. Me? I've got nothing. Okay. I <laughs> think I've depressed you listeners, if you're still out there, somewhere. Enough. I know I've brought myself down in the dumps, so... Let's see what's next for us in Ostium. After a hearty breakfast of the last of our leftovers and remaining supplies from our brief foray into the tiny town of Cavallo, 
that made Ostium look kind of big. And if this is news to you coming out of the blue, it means you missed one of my short recordings from before. We ready ourselves for the next door and what it might have to offer us. This time we're heading up into the unusual grasslands of Ostium. We walk for like 10 minutes, deeper and deeper into the green and farther away from the clock tower and those buildings of this town that have become oh so familiar to us. I'm starting to feel like I'm using that Wi-Finding app again. If this app doesn't ring any bells, you'll also find out all about it in one of my previous short recordings. Except instead of using my phone, this time it's somehow in my head, and I'm paying attention to any brain lean, any mental tug, any cranial pull that's bringing us closer to the next door Ostium wants us to go through. We lead in an easterly direction for a little bit, then back to the north, then a little northwesterly, then back to north again, and it's starting to feel like it's never going to end. I can see the boundary wall coming closer, and I start to wonder. The direction doesn't change anymore, and the stone palisade just continues to grow. Shortly after that, we both see the door in the wall, and we both know that that's our next destination. A bunch more minutes closing in on the second hour, we reach it. This is it? I nod, just like we thought. There's a door built into the stone wall. It looks solid and metal, like the door you'd imagine to a prison or on the deck of a military ship, an aircraft carrier, something that could be well locked and very hard to open if needed. On the front of this metal door are stenciled in white, numbers 325. Wow. We're both shocked. I couldn't even remember if the numbers went that high. I was pretty sure I had checked the map table thoroughly for numbers on the wall. Also that we had done a couple tours around the grounds of Ostium and never seen anything like this. It feels different. Like the store wasn't here yesterday. Or possibly even 20 minutes ago when we saw it for the first time. <sighs> Thank you once again, Ostium. I turn to Monica. She's ready. I swing it open and we go through to... city street. A crossroads, actually. I can see from the signs we're on Main Street and State Street. Well, that narrows it down. This could be just about anywhere in the U.S. From the looks of it, it's definitely not a big city. More in the town range, you know, ostium-sized. And I feel an immediate sense of familiarity. I've been here before. Where? There were a few trips I did with my parents, like... Catalina, before all that happened, but I've never been much of a big vacation guy. I don't like to travel far. However, when I do go on trips, I like to make it something awesome, worthwhile, and California has never failed in delivering that. We've got so much variety to entertain us in this state. There's a long drive I like to do a couple times a year, where I head north of San Francisco and then west to the coast when I can, usually through San Rafael and make my way up to Bodega, enjoy the Pacific Ocean for a bit with a lunch of fish, or what I consider to be the world's best New England clam chowder at Lucas Wharf. Then I drive through Sonoma County, enjoying a period of majestic redwoods, and then fields of vineyards sweeping across the hills. I'll usually stop at one of the many, many wineries, looking for my well-earned dollars, and then back to Oakland. I've also been up to Fort Bragg on the Mendocino Coast, and this is for real, not just when I'm lying to my friends about a place called Ostium, though I guess ultimately it was about a girl, sort of. Even made a trip all the way up to Eureka just to see what all the fuss was about. Get it? I've been to Southern California a number of times for both work and fun, or a combination of the two. Saw the artistic explosion known as Hearst Castle that's real heavy on the eyes. And once, with my most recent ex, we were together for two years and things were starting to get pretty serious before she decided I wasn't the one for her. We made this trip to an old west town, which still had a lot of its original buildings, it was called. Oh, shit. That's where I am. Where we are. We're in Columbia. I look to the right down State Street as I begin telling Monica the story of Columbia, its history and relation to me. 
Down there, I can see a sign in the distance that says Columbia, Kate's Tea House. Yep, we're here without a doubt. I had coffee there with Anne. We shared a pastry. A month after this vacation, she ended things abruptly. I started walking down Main Street, Monica following and listening. Columbia is a town located around the middle of the state of California and towards the eastern border in the substantial county of Tuolumne. It was founded in 1850, the same year California became a state, as a boomtown for the exploding gold rush that was causing thousands to flock to the state in search of gold and riches. And not just men looking to mine the yellow metal, but women, children, and families. We're now heading down the historical central district. On either side of us, parallel rows of buildings, all wooden and quaint and dusty and old, with various fronts advertising their wares within. I'm not going to lie. It definitely has a similar and familiar feel to Ostium. You've got your blacksmiths or your iron mongers, your candle dipping store, your requisite gold panning store. There are a couple of craft stores that look as if they're selling pretty similar merchandise, but one assumes on the inside their inventory varies somewhat. There's, of course, the very important candy store and the Fallon House ice cream parlor. And no old west town would be complete without your Pioneer Emporium. The farther end of town behind us is a larger and perhaps more impressive to some Fallon Hotel. A regular impressive looking hotel for those seeking the niceties when staying at a place that is not your home will likely prefer. After the Columbia Museum and Brown's Coffee House ahead of us, as we approach it and stop in front, is the Gold Rush Town period authentic Columbia City Hotel. If you're looking for the real deal with Victorian-style furnishings and decorated rooms, this is where you want to stay. The Columbia City Hotel is a restored 19th century country inn with elegant, authentic Victorian antiques in each room, custom-crafted wall coverings featuring beautiful lithographs. While they've attempted to keep this in the Fallon Hotel as faithful to 19th century decor as possible, modern conveniences such as indoor plumbing, heating, and air conditioning have been added for the comfort of the guests. When I first learned about this place referenced in a travel book, I knew I had to check it out. Anne and I liked going on the occasional trip, and while this was a bit of a drive and somewhat removed from the lavish style she was used to, I eventually convinced her. She wasn't a huge fan. I was way more into it than she was. We ended up staying for a four-day weekend, leaving early Thursday and arriving in the afternoon. It was kind of weird. Should have stretched through to Monday instead, but I had to work that day. Had an important deadline due. <laughs> wow, a deadline. Doesn't that sound like a weird concept to care about now? Yep. Anyway, since we arrived before the actual weekend did, it was totally dead here. Yeah, not as dead as it is right now. Not with the soul here. You know, for ostium reasons. But still, eerily quiet. Nowhere was really open. I had to get the key. No key card, that's for sure. Check and receive all the details from the Fallon Hotel, then drive down to our hotel. Found some parking in the back. The key let us in through the front door in our room. There wasn't a person around to be seen. I try the front door to the Columbia City Hotel and am not surprised to find it unlocked, unlike the last time I was here. We step inside to a welcoming sitting parlor. There's artwork along the walls that looks period authentic. A bookcase with some old dusty books, though I don't know if they're all authentically 19th century. I see some Twain, Moby Dick, some Poe, a nice selection. On the bottom shelf are board games. Some boxes look old and used though I'm pretty sure none of them were invented and painted until the 20th century. There's an ancient-looking version of Scrabble, which must be pretty gnarly to play. The parlor looks just like it did the last time, down to the same number of books. Whenever I see a bookcase or a bookshelf just about anywhere, my eyes are automatically drawn to it like a magnet to metal. Gee, I wonder why that is. Not that I blame you. I'm kind of the same. Well, combine that with my photographic memory. Don't worry. I haven't forgotten that you've got one, or at least mentioned it once or twice, or a couple of hundred times. <laughs> so, it looks pretty much identical to how it did then. But while I was drawn to the books, Anne was pulling on my hand and dragging me upstairs to check out the room. 
We wanted to make sure the bed、uh, was in working order. Uh huh. I see now why you and Anne had so much in common. Must have been her personality, her magnetism. <laughs> the room was lavishly decorated, just gorgeous. Though it only had a half bathroom. There was a shared shower room. Anne wasn't、uh, a fan of this, understandably. Still, I swear I told her about it in advance. She remains absolutely certain I didn't. Sounds like a healthy basis for a strong relationship based on good fucking. I,、um, <laughs> I've got nothing to say to that. Good to know that sometimes that can happen, and that I have the power to do it. Well,、uh, moving on now. Nothing to say for not very fucking long, huh? Um, I repeat, moving on. Let's、uh, let's check out the room upstairs. I、uh, I can feel the artifact is up there someplace. We started walking up the stairs, and at the top, I stop and make Monica stop behind me. In my defense, oh, this should be real good. There was no one around. No other guests checked into the hotel. If she wanted, she could have walked from our room to the shower completely naked. Taken her shower, then returned still naked to our room without being seen by a single other person. Except you. Except me. Guessing that didn't make a difference. Nope, not one fucking bit. Monica steps in front of me and heads down the hallway. It's your standard small hotel hallway, so like one of those at the Overlook or any other hotel that gives you the creeps. Lots of firmly closed doors that could lead to empty rooms or something much worse. That's when we hear the ghostly howl, just like on the Mary Celeste. Just great, just great. It stops Monica in her tracks. She looks at me. The blackness. I can feel it now. It's coming. But we still got time. Not a ton, but enough. Let's hope so. I'm behind her by the time she reaches the first door on the left. She turns, checks I'm ready, then turns the handle and throws it open. It's a quaint-looking room with impressive artwork, classy furniture, and a double bed with an ornate duvet. Then there's a loud moan. Monica slams the door. We're both breathing pretty heavy. I hope you had enough time to tell whether the artifact was in there or not. I did. It wasn't. All right then. It's at this point I should probably tell her I'm betting the artifact is in the room I stayed in at the end of the hall on the right. Basically, the absolute last room we're going to be checking, but I can't be sure—not a hundred percent. With the way things have been going in Ostium, it probably will be. But with the blackness coming and these weird sounds, I—we can't afford to take the risk. I try the door to the right. Monica at my side. Our hearts are still racing. I open the door and see a very similar room, different artwork, and slightly different design of furniture. Otherwise, the same. This isn't where the artifact is. Then I hear the growing sound of a growl. I don't wait for something else to happen. I slam the door shut. I look at her and I see a similar, bordering on terrified look on her face. Good. It wasn't just me hearing and reacting in that way to it. Next door, same deal. This time there's some creepy coughing. Monica doesn't slam the door this time, but closes it slowly. Perhaps giving me time to deduce whether the artifact is in there, or perhaps to make sure whatever is making the sound isn't disturbed in any way, catch its attention, or maybe a little from column A and a little from column B. I handle the next door on the right, more of the same, except for a hissing sound that begins almost immediately and steadily increases in volume. Well, <laughs> that's enough of that. Door closed. Moving on. Third door on the left. Another ghostly moan. Still no artifact. Third door on the right. A yell this time. Just as creepy. Neither of us wants anything to do with it. The next door is marked shower. Monica opens it slowly. It's a small shower room with one shower. The curtain is closed. There's the sound of water running. I can see the steam billowing up over the top of the shower curtain. Then the water stops. There's just a dripping sound. Then a dragging something. The shower curtain rings rattle and start to open. Monica yanks the door shut, looking at me. There's something weird about it, but it's definitely not where the artifact is. I shake my head. Next, 
The right door is also marked shower. I open it quickly. Same room. There's no water running in the shower. The curtain is open. There's no one or no thing in the shower stall. That's a relief. I feel something pulling me in, mentally, like the artifact might be in there. But it's different from any feeling I've had before. Sort of sharper, almost painful. I take a few steps into the shower room. Jake, wait! And the door slams in Monica's face. I just watch it, dumbstruck. It closed on its own with such fury, she immediately begins hammering on the door, yelling at me. Jake? Jake, are you okay? Open the door. Try to get it open from your side. Jake! I turn around, my body calm and collected. I'm not sure why. The feeling I'm having doesn't feel malicious in any way. I follow it, feeling it draw me to the window ahead, next to the shower stall. There's a small curtain covering it, giving whoever's using the shower a level of privacy. I reach it and draw the curtain aside and can see through the crystal clear glass. Below is not Columbia, as it should be. It's downtown San Francisco. What? I look up and see across from the office building where I used to work. I can see many windows. On the floor where I used to work and through those windows is me? Turning to look out, uh, I flail back, getting out of the view of the window. I end up falling into the shower stall. Bruise myself a little, but nothing serious. The floor of the shower is dry. No one's been using it recently in this alternate version of Columbia, as seen through the eyes and doors of Ostium. Once I know I'm okay, I pull myself up, count to 30, then peek through the bottom right corner of the window, keeping myself as hidden and sheltered as possible. Without a doubt, it's my office building. Well, the Ostium version when Monica and I were there. We're standing looking over the fourth clone of me, and it looks just as creepy from this viewpoint. At this point, I'm learning about the tanker that's run aground along the south coast of Britain. I'm not taking it well, understandably. Then we move on to the fifth simulacrum, where my cubicle used to be, where I'll learn about Catalina and what happened to all its people. I duck back down and crawl toward the door of the shower room. Once I'm far enough away to be seen from the window, I stand up and reach for the door. The banging from Monica has stopped. Maybe she just gave up, waiting for me to do something about it. Or... Maybe thinking something serious has happened to me and there's nothing she can do. Or perhaps worse, something has happened to her. I pull on the door and it opens with ease. I don't see Monica on the other side and my heart jumps into my mouth. But then I see her out of the corner of my eye, sitting on the ground, back to the wall, her head in her hands. I drop to my knees in front of her and I grab her hands, pulling them from her face. Then my hands delicately hold her head, tilting her face up to mine, her eyes to mine. Okay, I say. I don't know what happened in there, but I'm okay. I'm safe now. She gives me a nod, and I decide on a bold move, moving in to kiss her. She tilts her head up further, and our lips meet in soft warmth. Another moment that feels an eternity, but isn't. Then she's grabbing my shoulders and pulling herself up to a standing position. We move down to the next door. We're holding hands, doing this together now. We stand in front of the next door, and before she reaches to open it, I say, not this one. We turn to the right side of the hallway where the next door is. I shake my head. We move on to the next door on the left. On the front of the door, it's marked Night Watch. What the hell does that mean? I swear I've never seen this door, or any other door for that matter, with these words before. I visited Columbia with Anne before the Game of Thrones TV series started, but I'd read the books in the 90s when they came out. I would have totally noticed these two words on a door and freaked out about them. I can also feel the pull of the artifact much stronger here. The room I had stayed in with Anne was directly behind me. I can feel a pull from behind also. But the door marked Night Watch is where it's all at right now. Monica opens the door and I wonder what I'm going to see. Some sort of barracks type place for the Night's Watch guarding the wall from the wildlings? 
or maybe something from that crazy fantasy novel of the same name by the Russian author Sergei Lykonenko. Obviously, it should be the room where one of the hotel attendants stays should someone need help during the night. Like I said, when I stayed here, I wasn't even aware of this particular room, and if it had been here, it probably would have been empty anyway. Now, at this time, I'm sure it's empty. It's the same sized room as all the others, only different. There's no art on the walls. The room is devoid of furniture, except for a bed in the center of the room that looks to be a single. The duvet covering it is black. There's no pillow. It's in here, or at least part of it is. What does that mean? I'm not sure. I feel a strong pull in this room, but also a lesser pull behind me from the room I stayed in with Anne. I step into the room and walk to the bed. There's nothing on it, but I've honed my senses to this spot. In a strange fit of impatience, I rip off the duvet, blankets, and sheets, then the cover sheet until the mattress is exposed. And there it is. What looks like a golden C in the center of the bed. I reach out and pick it up. I immediately think C for Columbia, right? Makes sense. Each end of the C is jagged, like there's another part to this artifact that's missing that should connect to these jagged edges. I turn and look across the hallway at the final door. Monica has been following everything and knows what's next. The number on that door is, somehow, 325. I swear, truly swear, it wasn't like that just minutes ago. Again, I swear I saw a 10 on the door as I turned to the night watch door and saw an 8. And now it's changed? I can't help but snort as I imagine an image and then proceed to explain it to Monica, who's looking at me in confusion. In my head, I'm raising my shaking fist at the ceiling of the hotel and essentially at the sky, yelling out a long, drawn-out, Ostium! We have a little laugh about it, and then that's when there's a long, drawn-out howl. We haven't heard one in a while. Gotten how goddamn scary it sounds. It came from across the hallway, from room 325, the room formerly known as 10. Monica looks at me. You can't. I don't have a choice. The blackness is coming. We're quickly running out of time. If I don't find the other part of the artifact... It's all pointless. I can see her working things over in her mind. She's wondering, what if we just use part of the artifact? Would it work the same way? But she doesn't want to find out. Doesn't want to have to try to come back here. And knows if the partial artifact doesn't work, it might sever the connection. And end everything, including her chances of ever finding Steve. Alive or dead. I walk across the hallway feeling myself suddenly covered in a sheen of sweat. The moan comes again, and I look for what bravery I have left to confront whatever's on the other side of the door. I grasp the handle, turn, and push. The door swings open. I'm not sure how far Monica is behind me. I want her real close for support, possibly for protection and defense, because I'm pretty sure she can kick anyone's and anything's ass. But I also want her far away for her protection. Because, you know, that's manly and if I haven't made it perfectly clear before, pretty sure I'm in love with Monica. With the door now open, I can see into the room and it looks like the other rooms. Like the room we stayed in looked. I step inside and I see a queen-sized bed along one wall with a familiar duvet. The artwork and the furniture are the same. It feels eerily unchanged, almost as if we had never visited or this is the moment just before we stepped into our hotel room. A ghostly moan begins then, changes to really quiet voices. I can't quite hear what they're saying, but it sounds like there are two of them. I recognize a particular phrase, one that hits deep, because it's something I always say. I realize those voices are us, Anne and I, the sound of our arrival, 
in mild argument over the place. What the hell? Is time folding over itself? Are Anne and my other self going to start materializing before my eyes? Does that mean Monica and I are going to start dematerializing? I look at the window and can now see the blackness making its way down Main Street, consuming all within its path, swallowing everything. The voices haven't stopped, and if I stand perfectly still, I can just make out a few words. My own are a little easier with my deeper voice. It feels really weird to hear Anne's voice again. But I don't have time. Working on my gut feeling again, I go for the bed, ripping duvet and blankets up. Next, it's the sheets, and there on the mattress is the other gold sea. As this is revealed, and the voices of Anne and me disappear, and the ghostly wails begin again. Right. Ostium, or whatever's running the show here, isn't happy. Maybe it's a personification of the blackness? Giving it a voice? I don't waste time, grabbing the gold semicircle and heading out into the hallway. Monica is there and ready. We don't have time to get to the door again, do we? I shake my head, then grab her hand. We charge down the hall, the sound of the blackness outside clear and getting louder. What door will lead us back to Ostium? It's not like I ever know. I just get this feeling. Like I do with the artifact and the blackness and everything else Ostium likes to keep me informed about. I stop at the doors and shower on either side of us. I go through the one where there was something taking a shower not too long ago. I'm pulling Monica in with me, whether she wants to come or not. The water is off and the shower curtain is still closed. We run to the window and I immediately notice it's not your usual window. Instead of sliding up or down or swinging open, while it's still made of glass, there's a little glass doorknob on the side. Without hesitation, I turn and push it. In that same magical way, Ostium appears before us on the other side. You first! Monica doesn't question, and knowing it's not a ton of room, gets a running start and dives through. Damn, she's brave. Gonna have to really brace myself for impact on the other side. I get ready and see movement out of the corner of my eye. There's a hand coming out from behind the shower curtain, reaching for me. Fuck! I yell, and then pretty much tumble through the open window. The ground is hard and brings me back to earth and reality in a nanosecond. Monica helps me to my feet. That was a wild ride. I don't know... Uh, really starting to feel my age. Back at the clock tower and the map table, I take out the two golden C's, one from each pocket. Together, it seems painfully obvious. I almost see a, well, duh sign bubble over my head. I stick the two pieces together and they fuse before my eyes. Now the two C's have become a perfect O. Nice twist there, Ostium. The light this time is a shimmering fuchsia just as bright and blinding. We make some dinner and choose non-verbally to enjoy it on our own. We each need some solo time, we've somehow decided. Probably after everything that's happened today, and over the last few days. I sit there eating a can of warmed-up SpaghettiOs with Frank's. Not ideal dinner eating, I know. But I'm starving, and it sounded good. It's palatable. And that's when my brain starts doing some deep thinking. It doesn't go so well. I'm thinking about how we've gone through the same cycle again, and it's actually really freaking me out. First there was Roanoke, then the Mary Celeste. That's two places in the past. Then Mars, the future. Then Avalon, a place from my past, my life. And a bunch of weird shit happened, and it started all over again. The ancient cave in South Africa... The Anjakuni village, 
both from the past, the spaceship and Voyager probes, the future, and now Columbia from my life, my memories. Does that mean we're going to get a whole load of weird shit again? Is another earthquake going to happen? Another mighty crack in the world that will reveal another hidden door? And on the other side of that, my place of work again? Or somewhere else from my life where I'll find clones of myself or something else to really fuck with my head? And what will they reveal? Perhaps that's what I've been dreading over the last four days. That with each door I go through, each time I bring back a trinket, a piece of my world, the one Ostium is no longer connected to, is destroyed. Another catastrophic event, another devastating virus, another accident that wreaks untold havoc. It's what I felt each time I brought back an artifact and put it on the map table. And what about that hand reaching for me? Was it trying to get me? Was it trying to get the artifact? Was it related to the blackness somehow? A part of it? Is the blackness coming after me? Not to destroy this pocket in time that's been created by Ostium, but to help me. Perhaps save me? From what I was doing? From the death and destruction I've been causing? It's a possibility, in as much as it isn't. <sighs> you notice the particular pronoun I've been using? I've been very specific and clear about using me. I because I'm holding myself to blame here. All of those deaths are now on me. The more I think about it, the more real it seems. I'm killing all those people. I'm causing all that suffering. <laughs> Jake, Jake, look at me. Look at me, please. I've read about it, this weird thing. I mean, it's just fucking weird to me. I guess if you're religious, it can be different. Saving yourself for marriage, when you can be with your man or your woman or whatever it is you're into. Keeping yourself. Gah. Don't even want to say the word. Pure. Virginal. To share this special thing with the one you love. It seems fucking alien to me, which is damn funny when you know my story. 
my whole story. But that's not for a while yet. I fucked him. Put it down in stark terms. And it was great. No, it was fucking awesome. I haven't fucked someone, or been fucked, in too fucking long. I would have ended up jumping Jake sooner or later. Is he my type? I don't even have a type. Woman, man, gay, bi, trans. Where I'm from, those fucking terms don't even exist. I had to learn about them. Research the fuck out of them. Before I could wrap my mind around the concept. Fucking antiquated. Like something those folks in that ancient cave in South Africa might think. Juvenile. Ignorant. Just fucking wrong, man. So to put it plain... I was pretty fucking horny. It had been way too long. And I've mentioned before, a couple of times. I can't remember how many hints I've dropped. But he's a hot hunk of man, I'm not gonna lie, as he's fond of saying. And it didn't take long to know he was into me. And I'm not surprised. I'm a hot piece of ass. Come on, these are my recordings, my private thoughts. If I can't be honest with myself here, I might as well just end it all now. There'd be no fucking point. But he was going through something. Looked like the beginnings of a mental breakdown. I can't read his mind. Don't really know what was going on upstairs with him. He just looked like he was falling apart. Like I said before, I can't afford that need him to keep it together, to keep going, not give up. Just like I'm never going to. So I figured that was the right time to make a move. Help him how I could. And have a good time doing it. And like I said, it was fun for both of us. I come to, slowly regaining consciousness. It's that kind of sleep we all crave. The thorough, deep, satisfying rest that recharges and revitalizes. And when you wake up, it's not sudden or forced. You crawl into the light like a baby reaching for its mother and getting there without falling over or hurting itself. There's light, not too bright and not too dark, but just right. It doesn't stun you, but slowly filters in like the warmth of a day floating between the blinds of a hotel room on a beach in Hawaii. You're brought back to consciousness, as if on a bed of feathers and down. You want to open your eyes and join the land of the awake, because it feels great. It just feels right. And then I am awake, because I do feel great and right. My head's a little fuzzy, like it's been stuffed with cotton candy, but it's dissipating, like the wispy sugar it is. I can't remember where I am or who I am at first. Then one by one, like perfectly shaped cogs locking into place, the answers come to me. I'm Jake Fisher. I'm in Ostium. Clock Tower. And I'm in bed. My mind flashes back to five days ago, when I had that really weird but really awesome dream about waking up in bed in Ostium. In bed with Monica. The memories are coming back fairly quickly now as those cogs continue locking and the machinery begins winding. I'm not quite remembering last night in vivid detail. There are snippets here and there. Skin, thighs, breasts, moans from both of us. I would like to remember it all in intricate detail, but I'll take whatever I can. And then I remember back to before all that. Fun. Monica coming to me and kissing me making the night a whole lot better after, after, I can't really remember what. I remember feeling down, like really worried or scared or overcome by something, but can't remember what right now. There's just haziness and fuzziness and blackness where it should be. Blackness. That's an interesting word for it. Saying it almost makes it possible to see beyond it to know and comprehend what it is. But it's still eluding me, staying away. I'm not going to worry about it right now. If it was really important, I would be able to remember it easily. So therefore it's not, and as the seconds pass in this wonderfully comfortable bed, 
I can recall less and less about it, remembering more about last night and how fucking amazing it was. And I finally got laid. I looked to my side and see Monica looking at me, her head propped on her arm with a big smile on her face. Talk about a welcoming beam of sunlight. I could stare at her all day. Good morning, sleepyhead. Hope you had fun last night. I start stammering some nonsense words and she lets me off the hook. I guess the look on my face is enough to convince her we had a good time. A very good time. She gets up, saying she's going to throw some breakfast together before we set out for the next door. As she leaves the room, I see she's wearing a black tank top and these green booty shorts. For a second, it seems like it says Ostium on the rear, but I shake my head and instead see Hella. I sit up, still pulling myself together, and begin retrieving strewn pieces of my clothing and putting them on. So I was completely naked in bed, And after what we got up to, and the details are continuing to show themselves in a very fair light, that's not really surprising, but I usually like to wear something to bed and not go completely commando. Must have been really wrapped up in the moment. Fully dressed, I stand up and, before I leave, try one last time to remember what was going on with me after going through the door yesterday that took us to Columbia, but still can't remember anything. I head out of the room and begin helping Monica with breakfast and serving impressive volumes of strong, hot tea. With a clear mind and a full stomach, I guide Monica to the next door. I'm actually hoping we might find Steve behind this door or the next. Yeah, it's a little weird. I'm rooting for the woman I just slept with to find the guy she kind of had a thing for and clearly still has feelings for especially since I'd like to have many more nights like last night, now that I can remember it in intimate detail. But I feel I've supported Monica from the beginning with Ostium, since I've gotten to know her, because we're here on the same side. We have our goals, though I'll admit I'm not perfectly sure what I'm looking for, going through these doors and bringing back the artifacts. I guess it's to find what the big link is between Ostium and me. I think I've talked about it before, but I obviously have all these links with, like, every door we go through, so I need to find out what the big deal is and why Ostium wants me for some reason. So really, we do have our own specific goals, haven't really thought about it before in detail. Monica's got her focus, and I've got mine. We're a team, supporting and working with and for each other. You might say we're putting the T... T-E-A in team, you know, because we both like tea. The door this time is 199. The fact that it feels like an extreme odd number just kind of gets to me. I prefer them to be nice, solid, even numbers. Don't really know why. It's like minor keys versus major keys in music. They just sound off in some way. But it's not like I can do anything about it. This one's a weird one, like all of them, except it's one of those doors I've mentioned before that clearly defied the laws of physics. The door is hovering. Well, I suppose hovering isn't really the right word. That implies it can move around from location to location. This door is staying put, except that it's staying put four feet above the ground, horizontally, as in lying flat like a bed. How do we even get in this one? Monica's giving me a look, something to the effect of, How the fuck do we... I give her the old shrug of, Blame Ostium, it's not my fault. And then I set about figuring out how we do this. I guess, just go with it. I reach for the handle and turn, and the door opens inward like a trap door, only without a sound. Well, that was easy. And now we just jump in dive in like we're diving into a swimming pool. A swimming pool full of ambiguous blackness that can take us anywhere in time and space. Applying some levity, I draw in a deep breath and pretend to hold my nose, get a running start, and jump into the hole. I sure hope Monica follows me.
The landing is painful, as one might expect when being dropped from a four-foot height onto solid ground. Knowing I don't have long, I roll myself out of the way just in time to avoid Monica landing on me. Oh yeah, I hear you. A gentleman would have broken her fall, especially after we had enjoyed such shared pleasures the night before. It would be the least I could do. See, but here's the thing. With Monica landing on me, something in me might have broken. You know, like a bone. So I had to move out of the way. Also, Monica was ready for this type of ostium delivery option and rolled with it like a pro, dealing herself very minimal bruising. If she'd landed on me, we probably both would have been hurt, because of it being my fault. This way I'm only aching, though my ego took more of a bruising, and Monica, as she usually does, looks none the worse for wear. As I get up, I notice I'm covered in a yellowish ochre dust and proceed to dust myself off pretty much from head to foot. Monica does the same, not in such a dirty state due to the aforementioned skillful roll. Then the heat hits me. Dry, blistering heat. Has to be at least high 90s out here. Possibly over 100. I can hear bugs making themselves known, like cicadas. That immediately starts narrowing us down to a certain number of states. Also, it means we haven't materialized into an ancient time before the evolution of insects, which would be seriously long ago, like when the Earth's atmosphere was different and we probably wouldn't be able to breathe. Also, since it seems like the big deal with the ostium doors is taking us to places where people have disappeared, sending us back to a point before the evolution of the Homo genus doesn't seem right. Using my hand as a sunshade, I scan the horizon, making a complete turn. Monica does the same. We're trying to get our bearings, see if we can possibly recognize where we are. Naturally, I'm more likely to be successful at this since Ostium and I are like this. And since this is an audio recording and not a visual one, let the record show my fingers are crossed, indicating a strong relationship between this mysterious town and myself. I spot a high cliff face the same time Monica does. From our distance, we can make out small holes and caves in the rock face. I'm not certain, at least not yet, but my brain has an inkling of what these holes might represent, what this cliff face is, and what time we might be in. But I'm not about to make any guesses until I know for sure. I start walking toward the wall of rock. Monica knows the drill and follows. It doesn't take long to reach the cliff face. As I study some of the features presenting themselves to me, I confirm my thoughts about our location. I know where we are. This time there's no surprised look from Monica. She knows the drill and what to expect. She waits and listens for information to help us do what needs to be done on this other side of the door of Ostium. We're in one of four states. New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, or Utah. The year is, well, it could be a range of centuries, anywhere from the beginning of the 10th century up to 1350. It's probably sometime in the 14th century, which will make more sense once you get the full story. This village is home to a group of the ancestral Puebloan culture. Monica raises her eyebrows at the use of the word village. Looking at the cliff face, there are a number of holes at various heights, what look to be some narrow ledges and perhaps some storage structures, but from down here it's really hard to tell. To call this a people's village seems more than a stretch. A diverse and varied people who lived in various settlements toward the end of this period, they moved into caves and dwellings and cliff faces. It's not exactly known why. The evidence doesn't make it clear. It could have been due to limiting resources combined with attacks from enemies. They adapted and learned how to live in caves in the cliff face and created their own homes there to protect themselves. According to some archaeologists, there was a lot of fighting going on. Even some instances of cannibalism, purportedly. How many people lived in a dwelling of this size? No one knows for sure, which is often the problem with archaeology. It's an educated guess. A hundred? A couple hundred? Probably not more than that. And so, what, they mysteriously got up and walked away? Now it's my turn to look surprised. Actually, yes, that's exactly what the evidence shows. These settlements were simply abandoned. 
Now the contention is how long this took. Some say a settlement like this was just abandoned from one day to the next. Others say it took much longer, over a period of generations. Of course, those who support the former claim like to make it all the more dramatic, talking about how they left their supplies and granaries full. So, not quite to the level of the meals still hot while waiting to be eaten on the Mary Celeste, but... Anything to get a story. I swear I've heard about them before. Something about this just seems fucking familiar. I give her a no-shit look. Hey, fuck you. I know every time you go through a door it's a trip down fucking memory lane for you. But what you just said, what does Puebloan mean? Villager. Though for this particular period and these specific indigenous people located in the northern area, they were known by another name. The ancient ones, or ancient enemies. Anasazi. I knew it sounded familiar. Anasazi is a moniker that contemporary indigenous people aren't too happy with. The look on her face is priceless. That's moniker, as in M-O-N-I-K-E-R. Oh, you fucking did that deliberately, didn't you? Maybe, I say with a smile on my face. But it was some archaeologist way back when who uh, chose the term from the original language to make them easily identified. But ancient enemies isn't exactly what you'd like to call your ancestors. Hence, ancestral Puebloans. So let me ask a dumbass question. Hey, there are no dumbass questions in Ostium, or dumbass answers. Anything goes here. Naturally. And where's today's artifact going to take us? She asks, her eyes looking up. Well, that depends. How good are you at climbing? Better than you, that's for sure. The first ledge is about 30 feet high. The rock face is smooth, offering no nooks or crannies to get a grip with. But there's also a tree a little further along, an important tree. It's been hypothesized that this was how the villagers were able to reach their high homes, a tree with notches that worked as a ladder. Well, looks like one theory has been proved for this specific group. I indicate the tree and start climbing. Monica comes up behind me, because as we both know, she's much better at this than I am. And if one of us is going to slip, it's more likely to be me, and she might be able to do something to help, or choose to just let me fall to my death. So you know, the ultimate, I've got your back, trust fall situation. We reach the ledge, which can barely be called that. It's real narrow. I lead the way, taking short steps, leaning toward the rock face. I can feel the pull of the artifact higher up. I don't think it's at the very top level. I hope it's not the very top level, but we still have a ways to ascend. I make it to the next tree log. I check to make sure it's not going to move or roll while I start climbing. Seems sturdy. As I look at the wedges cut into the wood and start climbing, I wonder how these logs would have been used in regular daily life. Like when there was an enemy approaching. Were the logs somehow drawn up? I don't see any indications of rope or vine or anything that could be used to hoist them up. Were they just knocked away? Sent crashing, hopefully, into the attacking enemies below? And how did the people get down after the enemy presumably gave up and went away? Since I'm now reaching a pretty scary height, I'm just not going to think about that right now. On to the next ledge, I go even slower. They say to never look down, but when you're carefully stepping along a ledge, part of your vision is always looking down, so it can't be avoided. We reach our first wall. It's about four feet high, with small round holes in it for people to see through. It's not that hard to climb over, except when there's a hundred foot drop staring at you begging you to take a free one-way gravity ticket to the bottom. We pass through a granary filled with a plentiful stock of corn. Almost makes me hungry. There's a few ears that are on the ground in the middle of the granary where you walk through. It seems a little weird with how everything has been stacked so neat so far. But it is stacked corn after all. Sometimes that stack just crumbles to the ground like a house of cards. 
and then we reached the next D-branch tree, leading us up higher. I indicate to Monica, I think this should be the last one. We're definitely getting close to the artifact now. Up we go, and as we close in on the top, I start debating how much I want to go down these trees to get to the bottom. (laughs) About a million percent not. But it's not like I'm seeing an abundance of doors here that I might be able to use to get back to Ostium. And then I'm at the top and want to hone in on this artifact and get done with these dizzying heights, though the view and scenery are spectacular. I look right, then left, assessing the artifact's pull. I turn left and we go through another granary, equally well stocked. Three caves down, I stop and enter into the hole. It's roomy and definitely cooler than outside. I can even feel a bit of a breeze. But just getting out of the hot sun beating down on me is well worth it. We squat for a bit to catch our breath and lower our temperatures. I see markings on the wall, paintings of people and animals, of a life in the past. Well, I guess not that much in the past, since we've traveled back in time to pretty close to when these people disappeared. So not that old. The pictographs do look relatively new and fresh. Quite beautiful. With a mixture of blacks, whites, and browns, they tell of a normal life for these people living with each other and enjoying what this world had to offer. We move further inside, and I expect to see more signs of habitation. But there are none. A little strange. And then, in the last room of the cave, I see on the floor in the dimming light a piece of pottery. A pot's herd, I believe they called it. Though that might be when it's dug up from the ground and is hundreds or thousands of years old. This looks like it recently came from a vase or jug. But if that's the case, why isn't the floor littered with more broken pieces and not just this one? If it's snugly in the palm of my hand and has a series of black, white, wavy lines, it's quite striking. This is it. I put the piece in my pocket and turn to head back through the long cave. I think about what it's going to take to go all the way back to the solid ground. A lot. A lot of precarious and careful movement. We're going to be at risk of hurting ourselves. (laughs) Especially me. So, what other option do we have? Wait, I tell Monica. I turn around and walk to the back wall of the cave. It's rock, solid, impenetrable. I take out the pot's herd, looking at it. I flip it over and see a big O painted in white on the reddish clay-colored side. It's a vague triangular shape with one sharp edge. I hold it so that the pointed edge is sticking out like a weapon. Or a writing implement. Something you might use to make markings on a cave wall. I reach out, starting at the bottom and draw a long vertical line going up. Then a shorter horizontal line across then a line going down all the way to the floor. It's a rectangular shape, or a door. I think about drawing some sort of handle, but can feel it's not going to do anything. Also, it's unnecessary. I look at the piece of pottery again and see there's no wear on the sharp edge. It's still whole and pointed, as if it wasn't used to draw anything. Putting it back in my pocket, I reach out and touch the spot on the drawn door, where one would expect the doorknob to be. I look at Monica and see her just watching me in disbelief, but I can also see a spark in her eyes, a spark of hope. I push, and at first nothing happens. I'm just pushing against solid rock, and as I start to feel considerably more foolish, the cave wall begins to crumble and groan as rock is torn asunder. A gap forms along the line I drew, white light emanating from the other side. I push hard and the pictographic door begins to open, just like in those wacky Roadrunner cartoons. The door opens fully, its opposite edge somehow remaining attached to the cave wall, but also forming one long hinge, allowing the door to open properly. Ladies first, I say, with a smirk on my face. Uh Uh-uh, you made it. You get to test it out. As you wish. I step through into the bright white light, and Monica follows behind me. We're surrounded by all this white. Can't see anything of where we are. Once she's close to me, I hold her hand so we don't lose each other. But also, 
because I like holding your hand. With my other hand, I reach out and close the door. What the fuck are you doing? Monica manages before the door is closed. Almost immediately, the bright white light begins to lessen, transforming into normal bright sunlight. Except there's no visible ball of hydrogen gas anywhere in the sky. But that's because we're back in Ostium. We let out our breath simultaneously. In front of us is the clock tower, just like it was that other time we went through an unknown door. As we head inside, I look back, wondering if we actually came through one of the ostium doors, or did I just cut a hole in reality with an artifact and pass through back to ostium like it was nothing? If that's the case, that must have required an immense amount of energy. It leads me to Newtonian laws, how everything needs to be balanced, and how nothing can truly be destroyed but simply transformed. Where does all the energy come from? Where does it go? sort of sacrifice has to be made. Depressingly, this leads me to the cost Ostium seems to have exacted, not just on us, but perhaps on others. And then all that death happening on my home planet comes back to me. I'd totally forgotten it, like it was hidden in my mind. How could I have forgotten that series of horrible tragedies, that devastation and death? Inside the clock tower, as Monica is preparing yet another batch of award-winning tea, I bring this to her attention, voicing my thoughts, feelings, and concerns. She turns to me, and for just a second I see a look of exasperation in her eyes. What the hell? But then it's gone, replaced by, well, a sultry look. Is that lust? Monica comes hungrily at me, and I'm in her arms, falling to the floor as we tear at each other's clothing, wanting to feel flesh get skin to skin and satisfy those pleasure centers in our brains and <clears throat> other parts. A while later, the water in the pot starts boiling for tea, but we don't care. We're already hot enough. The place is called Rapa Nui, or as it's better known, Easter Island. You know, that tiny island way the hell out in the ass end of the Pacific, far west of Chile. I think it was around there Captain Cook and his crew had trouble finding basic things like food and water. And I don't remember if it was around there that the boat, um, the Essex, had its problems with the troublesome whale that basically sank the ship and left a bunch of guys stuck in a couple of whaling boats fending for themselves. And eventually they had to fend off each other, too. As in that taboo that most people don't like to talk about. No, not incest. Cannibalism. I think it was around there. And that's where we've been taken today, courtesy of Ostium, through door number 222 which ended up being a nice, normal door on the regular old streets of Ostium. Find the origin of that mental tug, turn the handle, step inside. 
done and get transported back to some point between the 8th and 19th centuries, though it looks to be more on the earlier side with the whole lushness of vegetation and trees surrounding us. But we'll get to that in due course. I don't know what it is, but I feel especially spiffy today. Just on top of the world, pretty much. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little achy from last night's, um, let's say, romp. Well, more like last afternoon's that lasted into the night. We did get some food in us, eventually. But this morning, after a very restful night's sleep, I'm just feeling A-OK. Like everything is going just right with the world. Of course, our world is a little different now, since we're no longer connected to it, and there's really only ostium. But let's not put a damper on things. It does seem like it might get a little boring sometimes, going through a new door every day, getting taken to another world in time, but doing it over and over again, bringing that artifact back each time, putting it on the map table. Oh, and we did eventually manage to add that piece of pottery from the Anasazi settlement to the map table, so don't worry about us forgetting about it. All done and taken care of albeit a little delayed when compared to our usual rigorous schedule. But life is just grand right now. Can't get me enough ostium. Even though it's not always clear what we're doing all of this for. But at least there were no more bodies of those men that Monica sent through the door to deal with. I talked a little more with Monica about them and just what bad people they were. I'm never one to condone violence and the thought of killing is anathema is a strong word, but it's not hard enough. Abhorrent. The thought of killing another human being is abhorrent to me. But when hearing about what those men were like, what they did to Monica and Steve, how their lives were ruined because of it, how finding Ostium was a godsend, it gave Steve an exit, a place of release, somewhere to get away. And then when Monica had no choice, she had to follow to end the pain and suffering and follow her heart. It just feels right, both what Steve and Monica had to do, but also what those men did to them, how they treated them. It's almost like they got what they deserved. And she didn't outright mur- kill them. She sent them through that door alive and well. If they didn't know what they were getting into, they should have stayed away. They came once, found nothing. That should have been it. But no, they had to come back for more, to be sure. And they got what they deserved. How those we've found so far died remains a mystery. Perhaps their deaths were carried out somewhat peacefully. Maybe it didn't hurt when the end came. Perhaps the blackness came and swallowed them whole. Atomized them. Then reconstituted them in another place, another time. And that's how we found them. Lives gone, bodies left. Whether we'll find more remains to be seen. The coast was all clear yesterday, at least. And as for Steve, his circumstances were very different for entering into Ostium and its doors. Akin to ours, one would say. Just like Monica, I believe he's alive in there somewhere. We've just got to find him. It's our job now, not just Monica's. He's got to be very lost, and we need to help him. I have my own part to play in finding out what Ostium wants with me and why I'm intrinsically tied to it, but also to find Steve alive and well, of hale heart and mind. Those are our goals. But getting back to Easter Island, Rapa Nui. It means Big Rapa, coined after the slave raids of the 1860s. According to the evidence, archaeology, and what historians have been able to deduce, the island was first settled sometime in the 8th century, presumably from people reaching the island by ship. Well, not presumably, certainly. They didn't have any other way. They couldn't exactly fly from South America to the island, right? But they must have enjoyed a wealthy time of prosperity with all the growing vegetation and abundant wildlife that had been protected for so long in isolation. Like all islands that have little interaction with other places, when people or invading species first land on the island, 
pretty much all the fauna there doesn't know what to expect. They've never seen anything like this invading being before and don't know to necessarily run in fear and or terror before they're attacked and killed. Capturing and eating that original wildlife must have been pretty easy. But as the population grew, the toll on the resources of the island began to rise. The big problem with an island is that those resources are never infinite. Eventually, you're going to run out of food, of wood from trees for building stuff, or vegetation for using however you see fit. This seems very likely what started to happen to the people of Rapa Nui. And then the island was discovered, and more outsiders came, slave traders, and everything pretty much went to hell for them. Nowadays, there are some descendants surviving, getting by with what remains, and profiting a little from the considerable tourist trade. So, getting back briefly to the name Rapa Nui, Big Rapa, so named because of its resemblance to the island of Rapa in the base islands of the Austral Islands group. Though the explorer Thor Heyerdahl thought it was the other way around. Te Pito o Te Henua, or the navel of the world, is also purported to be its original name. And according to oral tradition, its original name might have also been Te Pito o Te Kainga a Haumaka, or the little piece of land of Haumaka. And the Spanish refer to it as La Isla de Pascua, but enough about white dudes asserting their right to naming an island with native peoples they know next to nothing about. Let's move on to what the big draw is to tourists and archaeologists and explorers and anthropologists each year. The Moai. They are the mighty stone monoliths carved by the people of Rapa Nui between 1250 and 1500. If you've never seen one before, it's like a big thick stone statue with the head about a third the size of the body. The chest is bare, nipples carved in relief, and lines along the sides likely describing arms. They'd make great door stoppers, you know, for likely a really big giant. In earlier times, the statues were scrubbed to a smooth surface with pumice rock. Since it's a volcanic island, this wasn't too hard to find, though apparently the smooth surface erodes pretty quickly with the natural elements. The Moai are thought to represent chieftains, leaders, and important ancestors of the Rapa Nui. The more recent Moai had representative top knots of the chieftains they were meant to be, known as Pukau, made from a reddish rock known as Red Scoria. While a large number of Moai were left at the quarry site, there were still over 900 that were dragged to various sites all over the island using a system of sledges and sheer human strength. Though that's where a lot of these trees went, into making those giant sledges to carry those giant heavy rocks. The tallest Moai, called Paro, were 33 feet high and weighed over 90 tons. The heaviest Moai, Ahu Tongariki, weighed an impressive 95 tons. One unfinished Moai would have been a true giant among the rest of the Moai, weighing almost 293 tons and would have been a whopping 69 feet tall. Yeah, I know. Hold on to your butts. And here we are on Rapa Nui from long ago. It's an island full of life and greenery. Of course, there's no real sign of animal life, but everything floral is having a hell of a time. And there are a few moai around making themselves proudly known, standing majestic on green hills looking down on their creators with all the power and dignity the creators were trying to imbue them with. It's... It's fucking incredible. It's like seeing the pyramids how they were originally or that perfect-looking sphinx, or the original pristine Golden Gate Bridge, that magnificent-looking Statue of Liberty, a bright, shining beacon from afar, and that pinnacle of architectural excellence, the Eiffel Tower. Dragging Monica behind me, I run over to the nearest one, which happens to be about a hundred yards away, so it actually takes a bit of running. But the closer I get, the more I can feel Monica speeding up, then matching me feeling the thrill of ostium in this door, in this unique, incredible place. We reached the giant moai together out of breath, like a couple of kids racing each other down the hill to the park. 
She seems just as ecstatic as me to be this close to something this awesome. We just bask in its majesty, its perfection, until we regain our composure. The very surface of the moai shines and sheens in the sunlight, giving it an almost ethereal look, as if it were something sent down from on high by a greater power. So, in case you haven't guessed, the artifact is up there somewhere. What? Oh, are you fucking kidding me? Of course, of course it is. This is fucking Ostium. This sort of shit isn't scripted. <laughs> the good thing is, after the last door, I've gotten pretty good at climbing, if you catch my drift. No kidding. Well, the good thing is, I'll be right under you, ready to catch your ass when you fall. <laughs> good. That definitely helps my confidence. But no checking out my ass while I'm climbing. Honey, that's all I'm going to be checking out. With one giant shit-eating grin on my face, I start climbing. While the surface is pretty smooth, there are lines and carvings here and there to give the body of this big moai definition. Using these, I ascend from the side of the moai. This guy's a big sucker, probably around 30 feet. But I'm in the zone now, skillfully using my hands and feet to find whatever crevice or handhold I can use to hoist myself up higher. I'm not sure where the artifact is on the moai, but it's up there somewhere. Because this is one of the older moai, not the ones that will get made two or three hundred years in the future. There's no top knot or pukau to deal with, it's just a big head with a triangular nose and those divots for eyes. I bet it's in one of the eye sockets. Can't really be anywhere else. I start to wonder why Monica didn't offer to climb the moai. She probably could have done it in a half or a third the time that I'm doing it, and made it look good. I wouldn't have been worrying about her falling at any point, unlike she is with me. I give her a brief look down, and she sends me back an encouraging wink. I got this. But this isn't for her. She's looking for Steve. I'm all about the artifacts and the place. That's my domain. So it just wouldn't be right to have her do this part. It's not a chivalry thing, it's just the way things are done in Ostium. For all I know, Monica could try and find the artifact and not find it at all. She doesn't have my honing sense. But also, it might not appear to her. It might simply cease to exist. Just like she can't get through the doors on her own. She needs me. Huh. It's something I haven't thought too much about before. I knew she needed me to help her, with Steve, and continuing through the doors of Ostium. But when I lay it out like this, Monica's basically helpless without me when it comes to this place. She couldn't do a thing without me. It gives me power over her, which, being Monica, I'm sure she's not a fan of. But it hadn't really occurred to me before. Interesting. Okay, I got this. I'm starting to feel close to this Mohai. Not just because of physical closeness, but because we're going through a lot together, with he being the vessel for the artifact and my having to climb all over him. You might say there's something between us. Or not. I reach the sculpture's eyes and find them sunken and empty. Great. I have no other option but to keep going up, and at the very top of the moai, on the flat surface of his head, I find it. It's a little birdman effigy. Well, to be exact, it's half man, half bird. It happened a little later during the span of the Rapa Nui culture, as the leadership veered from the sole chiefs to a warrior class. That birdman figure was the symbol of the warrior class. Seems kind of weird and interesting at the same time to see it here, since it's thought with the rise of this birdman cult as it's known, they're pretty sure the construction of Moai stopped. Nevertheless, I know it's the artifact. I pick it up, feeling its stony weight, and put it safely in a pocket. And then begins the fun of climbing back down this sucker, which is never as easy as climbing up. Monica is watching me below. I give her the thumbs up, turn around, and start inching myself down. It's going okay. I'm taking it real slow, watching where my feet go, making sure that they have a solid purchase, and then easing myself toward the ground, while gravity keeps trying to make me do it much faster and easier. It's about halfway down, that what I thought was a secure foothold turns out not to be. Maybe there's a bit of dirt or moisture or moss there. Whatever it is, my foot slips, and with that goes my leg, and then the rest of me. 
Then I'm falling backward and away from the Moai. I have time to think I'll land on my back, which hopefully won't be too bad. I lift my head to avoid a cranial collision and cry out, Monica! And then I land on Monica. But it really isn't that bad. She's absorbed and fallen back with my fall, letting my trajectory bring her to the ground. We're both a little sore and bruised, but nothing like I would have been if she hadn't been there to catch me. I roll off of her, our breaths once again strong and fast. I look at her and see her looking at me. We start giggling and then laughing really loud. It's a combination of fear and release and feels great. And then I'm crawling over to her and kissing her. And she's kissing back and it's it's just awesome. Our hands run over our bodies and soon belts are loosened and clothing is shed. Monica, like some prophylactic magician, whips out a condom from somewhere, and that's when I know we won't have to cut this canoodling session short. Wait. She says as I'm about to start. What about the blackness? Don't worry. I'm holding it back. We've got time. Sure, but don't make it too quick, okay? I give her my winning, beaming smile, and then I'm kissing her again. We make it back to the door in time before the blackness reaches us. Not a ton of time, but a decent cushion. It's clearly visible, speedily making its way towards us. Just before we step through, Monica turns to me and says, And in case you're wondering, we're totally in the Mile High Ostium Club now. It's only members. Then she's gone. On the other side, it's back to the clock tower, and this time we take care of the artifact on the map table right away. I don't know if I've ever mentioned it before, but from one nerd to another, doing this definitely reminds me of Ghostbusters, after they've caught the ghosts in the trap and put it in the storage containment with the extremely powerful protection grid. Light is green, trap is clean, and it actually is an iridescent green in this case. Over dinner, I talk more about Rapa Nui with Monica, and that's when a thought occurs that I voice across the table. If we were in an earlier time of the Rapa Nui culture, when the Moai were pretty new, the population would have been considerable. In the many thousands. It wasn't until later, centuries later, that there was a decline in deforestation and people started dying. And after the slave trade, the population obviously plummeted. At one point, it was as low as 111 people. But we weren't there at any of those times. It was much earlier when the people were plentiful and happy. And now they're not there anymore. Snuffed out. Because of Ostium. Because of the door. Because of me. These are the thoughts that begin piling onto my conscience. Like a football being smothered by a hill of football players. Nothing can stop it. Monica tells me I can't think like that. There's no way of knowing. Why would Ostium be doing this if all those people were dying because of it? It just doesn't make sense. There has to be a better reason better purpose for all this. This appeases me a little, but not fully. I tell her she's right and move on to another conversation. Inside, I'm not so sure. After dinner's all done and cleared away, Monica says she's going to take a shower. As she goes into the bathroom and strips down to her birthday suit, she says, Care to join me? It doesn't take me long to shed my own clothing and join her under the hot water. We have another amazing time. And afterwards... We're both ready for bed, because tomorrow's another day and another door. The guy's finally asleep. I gotta hand it to him. He's got some stamina, of course. We are doing it a lot. That's probably helping. And while I'm doing what needs to be done so I can find Steve, still, it ain't bad. Ain't bad at all. I'm having a real good time. Mr. Cutie's actually great in the sack. Who knew? Being a video game developer and all, will wonders never cease? I try. I keep trying. But he keeps remembering. The suffering. The death. 
the cost he thinks Ostium is causing. He's not sure. I know I'm not sure. But I gotta keep him focused, keep him going. Without him, the ball game's over, no doubt. But so long as I can keep him happy, keep him going, keep this train running, then everything will be fine. Got close today, though, in that Easter Island place. I was ready for him, if he fell. And fall he sure did. But I knew how to catch him, how to take the fall. And then one thing led to another. It was all good. It was all fucking great, in fact. But going back to the door. He never even saw the body. Another one of them. I couldn't tell who it was. Black hair. He was face down. Got what he deserved, like the rest of them. Good riddance. Maybe I need to go through them all. Find every single one of their lifeless bodies. Before I can find Steve and find out just what the fuck happened to him. But still, today was good really good. It was fun being in that place, running with him, fucking him. Got all the juices flowing, all the emotions running. I kind of don't want this thing to end. Time will tell, I guess. 